The General Agriculture Workers Union is back calls for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture to give additional details on the 745,000 jobs created under the flagship planting for food and jobs program. The group insists jobs are verifiable and that a further clarification spelling out the type of jobs created will put the matter to rest once and for all. The ministry has come under intense pressure from the minority in parliament since the sector minister, Dr. Uso Friyakoto, claimed jobs are now available for many. Gawu is of the view additional details could boost confidence in the program. Deputy General Secretary Andrew Stego spoke to join news on the sidelines of a stakeholders forum organized by NGO Saint Ghana to assess the policy. There is more in the following report by Joseph Akable. The forum was to offer civil society organizations, farmers and our Greek ministry an opportunity to assess the policy. Launched in April 2017, the Planting for Food and Jobs seeks to assist farmers with inputs to boost production and create more jobs. The first to address the forum was Senior Agri Officer at the Ministry of Food and Agri, Michael Osu. He said about 200,000 farmers have so far been registered under the program, with more than 100,000 fertilizers supplied to farmers. Challenges such as delay in supply of inputs, inadequate storage facilities affected the program. The Agricultural Workers Union is, however, concerned about inadequate details on the jobs created so far. Andrew Stego is Deputy General Secretary of GAU. I think that um, when we say uh, jobs and we say employment, um, it is visible. Uh, you are employed and you know your employer. People in the informal economy, if you want to create jobs for them, we, we look at the type of job and how it can be classified as a, as a job. What we are uh, saying is that really it is government's responsibility to uh, provide jobs for e-people and then uh, we are okay if government is providing jobs but in this particular sector we want to see the type of jobs that have been provided uh, how the jobs have been provided where the jobs uh, are and whether it meets criteria for what we call a job. The Peasant Farmers Association has also been assessing the policy. They say the delay in distribution of inputs for farmers affected smooth implementation of the policy. A member of the association, Bismarck Norte, spoke to the press. I think the, the, the first issue that everyone is talking about is the early arrival of inputs. I would have expected that even by now, uh, the input should have been distributed to the various regions for distribution to start. I don't know how far we've gone with that, but I hope something is better done about that. Also, we are also pleased about the expansion of the, the program to include other crops. We've advocated for that, and we wish that the capacity of this local seed producer also built to ensure that we don't spend so much money to import all these seeds when we can have them locally and generate revenues and everything is kept here. The Ministry of Agriculture is, however, confident the second year of the policy implementation will be better. Its representative hall referring the request for details on jobs created by the sector to the sector minister explained the target is to increase registered farmers on a program from 200,000 to 500,000 in 2018. Achievement, like I said, for maize, we are getting you know, a lot of output, about 300,000 metric tons, rice, about 171,000 metric tons, and vegetables as well. So these are additions that you know, the program is you know, uh, adding to the national output, which I think is very, very uh, great. Fall army worm was also a challenge, and then the, you know, farmer extension ratio is also a major challenge. But I said that, you know, last year we added a thousand to the number. This year, hopefully, another thousand will also be added to the, you know, number to help with the extension delivery. Organizers of the event send Ghana intend to facilitate similar assessments of other government programs in the future. The government is appealing to some members of the 2016 batch of unemployed nurses from public institutions to end their picketing at the health ministry. Speaking at a news conference here in Accra, Information Minister Mustafa Hamid assured government has made provision in the 2018 budget for the recruitment of 32,000 health personnel. He promised the nurses they will soon be recruited upon completion of the validation process. Let's first listen to concerns of the unemployed nurses picketing at the health ministry. Since uh, uh, our year of completion, we completed 2016, and we have submitted several petitions to the ministry concerning our posting, and they have given us sick promises, sick promises sick every day. Every day that we come, they will say that they are working on our things. They are working on our issues every day. That's why they keep us there. We came out with a press release that we want them to state clearly that when are we going to be posted. 
is affecting us so much psychologically, emotionally, everything we do. Because um, your parents have suffered enough to send you to school, complete and come back and put your burdens on them. In fact, it's not easy at all. Sometimes we, are, we get frustrated. My mom used to call me a bit of because I always go to her to request for money. So if I don't ask money from her, I will not get money to buy anything for myself. Mm. So we are pleading on the government that they should do something fast, support all of us. And I also plead on them that they shouldn't pile nurses to stay in the house for long again. Because the more we stay in the house, the more we forget things. So that's what I'm begging the government to work, to post all of us immediately. The Information Minister Musa Fahamid says the unemployed nurses will soon be engaged. Government wishes to appeal to them to discontinue the picketing and go home whilst the Minister for Health works to get them placement as has been assured. It is important to state that when we came into office in 2017, there was a backlog of graduates from 2015 to be absorbed. As we speak, nearly all those in that category have been absorbed. Since 2017, government has engaged more than 16,000 of those who graduated between 2012 and 2015. It is also significant to state that the government of Ghana has since 2014 stopped the policy of bonding student nurses, which basically means that government is no longer under an obligation to engage them when they finish school. Even so, government has made provision in the 2018 budget for the recruitment of 32,000 health personnel, including 27,000 for various categories of nurses alone. This being done, sorry, this is being done with the 2016 badge of graduates from government institutions who are currently the ones that are picketing at the Ministry of Health. We are therefore appealing to them whilst also assuring them that we are working to get them engaged as soon as our validation processes are complete. Incidentally, though, Health Minister Kwekwe Jumamenu in an earlier interview with Joy News' Maxwell Agwagwa was unable to give a timeline on when the Ministry of Finance will finish with a financial clearance to pave way for the hiring of the nurses. They are sure that they will be posted very soon, right? Yeah. But before you finished and you got that assurance, mm. some people had been assured earlier. So is the financial clearance bit the only thing um, delaying the process for the 2016 batch right now? No, those nothing picketing. is delaying it. The only thing is that we want to find out those who have sat home for nearly five years, whether they are still waiting for jobs or not. We don't want to leave them behind. Yeah, so for the 2016 batch, by middle of... For them, I don't see their problem. Mm. I don't want how, to how so... Let me tell you honestly. Yes. Now I will do an application to finance. I think I've even got a draft I mean, request there. Mm. I don't control finance and their timing mm. and what they will do. Last year, from experience, at times they give financial clearance and it will take effect in three months, yeah. right? Because they are running the budget. And when you're implementing budget, you want to make sure that you don't have overruns in certain quarters. Mm. And I don't speak for them, so I can control them. Mm. So if I tell you that I can give benchmarks, I don't think I'll be getting it right. Mm. Okay. Joseph Osewusu then eventually moved the motion to allow for the House to debate the approval of the report. 
MP for Bogatanga East, Dr. Dominic Haini, raised an objection insisting the House cannot go ahead with the debate and approval because the issue is pending at the Supreme Court. With reference to Order 93, Sub Order 1 of the Standing Orders of this House, Mr. Speaker, it provides that and I read, reference shall not be made to any matter on which judicial decision is pending in such a way as may, in the opinion of Mr. Speaker, prejudice the interests of the parties to the action. Mr. Speaker, I'm drawing the House's attention to a suit that is pending before the Supreme Court. Any comments, whether adverse or commendatory, that are made in this matter may send the wrong signal to the Supreme Court with respect to this matter. But Majority Leader Seiche Mensabuntu insisted the point of order was incompetent because there have been precedents of issues pending before the court being dealt with in the chamber. If Parliament went ahead to approve it, and in the wisdom of the Supreme Court, they felt that the matter was not right, and they ruled, whatever Parliament did would then be considered as null and void. It's, it's part of the application. So why, why is it? The speaker admits that this application is a complete abuse of the processes of this house. Anytime anybody feels aggrieved um, and a matter is before the house, that person then will rush to the Supreme Court and tie the hands of this house from, from, from considering that, that point. The speaker, that is not right. Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Kwe, eventually ruled that there wasn't enough substance to allow for them to pull brakes on the approval process. There must be mutual respect between all arms of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. There is nothing before me this morning to persuade me that the matter allegedly before the court or any matter regarding say or any order made by the court alleged today is such that Parliament cannot do its work. A motion to be competently before this honorable house must be moved and seconded. Thereafter, a member may object to anything or make any reference to any demand when moved and seconded. Otherwise, if you anticipate wrongly, this is misconceived, it is premature, it is incompetent procedurally. The motion is accordingly rejected. Following a debate on the report, the speaker eventually announced the approval of the recommendation from the committee. Dr. Dominic Haine insisted the speaker's ruling was wrong. Unlike um, a judicial body, the ruling of the speaker is a political statement because we are a political body. Um, a, a, the ruling of a judge may be challenged on appeal or on review, but the ruling of the speaker may, I mean, cannot be challenged. So it means that the report has been adopted. The standing orders make provisions to challenge the speaker's Yeah, ruling, you, can come by, you can come by a substantive motion. You know, to challenge Are you ready to do that? I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to be seen as someone, an obstructionist. You know, who is simply obstructing the process because as is, you know, out in the public domain, we are afraid of uh, the special prosecutor. There's nothing like that. We, nobody is afraid of If I were afraid of him, I would not have taken him on the way I have done. Attorney General Gloria Kofo says government will not hesitate to revoke the appointment if the Supreme Court rules against them. It is true that an action has been brought in the Supreme Court against the 
nomination of Mr. Amidou as special prosecutor. But Parliament has not been injuncted. The mere initiation of a suit does not serve as an injunction. In the absence of that, I think Parliament is in right in proceeding with the appointment. Dr. Ayri cited the examples of the appointment of um, Mohamed Mumini and a number of others and said that in those scenarios and even the 40s deal debate, you know, Parliament put breaks because... He said could. Then it leaves it to their discretion. If he says could, it means that Parliament, for whatever reason, could decide to stay at hands. But in the absence of an injunction, Parliament is free to proceed and they are right in doing so. So what could this mean if, for example, the, you know, the Supreme Court eventually rules that uh, the approval was wrong because it was really over age. Appointments are always revoked, but touch wood. I am confident that Mr. Amidou's uh, appointment will be confirmed by the Supreme Court. From Parliament House in Accra, my name is Joseph Opokugapo. We're taking a break here on Joy News Prime, but still I in the bulletin. We bring you excerpts from the concluding part of our latest hotline documentary, Death Row and why successive presidents have avoided signing off death warrants. In Accra Metropolitan Assembly to shut down six public toilets at Old Father Mahia in Accra operating the outlawed pan latrine system. Stay tuned, we'll be back in a bit. Welcome back to Joy News Prime. Now, on Monday, we brought you the first part of the Death Row documentary by Seth Kwame Boating, who spoke to inmates jailed for murder, manslaughter, and related charges. The second part of the documentary focuses on interventions and the need to completely repeal the death penalty from our statutes and why successive presidents have avoided signing off death warrants. Here are excerpts of the documentary, and then later, I get to speak with Seth Kwame Boating on what went into the production of this documentary. Many presidents have very interesting perspectives of the death penalty. During his time as president, John Ajekum Kufo never signed the death warrant. As a trained lawyer, he has a certain deeper insight about why it hasn't been easy for heads of state to sign off people's deaths. I, I believe the general trend in many parts of the world now is uh, to commute death sentences to life sentences. Uh, reasons can be found in uh, humanitarianism and also in religion. The humanitarian theory he believes stands for valuing the lives of all, individual human rights, justice for everyone, and government that defend all of their people. But these are not the only factors that influenced his decision not to execute any prisoner condemned to death. Also, uh, in the fact that with modern science, uh, people who have been condemned sometimes uh, awaiting execution have come to be found not guilty uh, through, say, DNA examinations and things like that. And uh, it's, Personally, it's been against my conscience mm. to take life, mm. no matter what. Mm. Uh, because uh, if you like, the, uh, I'm influenced religiously mm. to know that it's only God that should take life. Mm. Not, I'm not a creator, so uh, whatever it is. And since the Constitution has found it wise to give the power uh, to commute to President, when I have it, I'd rather keep you as a, a convict uh, to serve your time um, away from the community. So even if uh, you say you are like a hardened criminal, you'll be there isolated. To save your life. President Kofor is a staunch Catholic and his position on capital punishment is in line with Catechism.
According to the 2018 Ghana Demographics Profile, 71.2% of Ghanaians are Christians, and the Bible is their standard of measure. It is the reason I have come to the Holy Spirit Cathedral to meet the Metropolitan Archbishop of Accra, Archbishop Gabriel Charles Pamabako, for some analysis on what the Bible says about capital punishment. But for us as Christians, capital punishment is not the solution to any problem of social uh, malfeasance, miscreancy, and the rest of it. I think that is how I would look at it. So Seth Kwame Bwati, who produced the documentary, he's joined me in the studio now to share some of the findings when he visited the prison. And uh, welcome, Seth. Thank you, Israel. Now, seeing it that uh, in the documentary, it becomes obvious that we haven't, the last person or the last president to have signed off a death warrant was the uh, ex-president Rawlings. Have you tried to speak with him? What went into his decision to sign off that death warrant? Yeah, we tried before we put together this documentary. In fact, we went to him twice two times and he had promised granting us in, an interview we go there and it turns into a different conversation so the uh, times that we visited uh, he couldn't speak to us he gave us time to come back again and we, we didn't hear from him until we put together this documentary I really wanted to find out why he did the last execution and how he feels about the fact that um, uh, presidents who followed him who came after him have refused to, to sign this. Yeah, because uh, after him, we've had uh, uh, former uh, President, president Kukuo, Kukuo, yeah. we've had uh, John the late Vassata President Mills. John Evans, uh, uh, well, John Mahama, and then we now have uh, President Kufuadu. Kufuadu. Yes. Do we know if President Kufuadu will sign? I asked the Interior Minister this question. He told me he can tell. So if we're having all these presidents refusing to sign ex executions, why do we still have the death penalty on our statute? That's the irony, you know. Um, they are not killing them, so they are adding on to the numbers. So where they are, I stated in the documentary, was made for about 23 inmates. Now we have 158 inmates occupying that small space, and they are not ready to kill them. So um, the Constitution Review Commission recommended that this is repealed, uh, death penalty is repealed. So uh, we are waiting for the president to, to act on that as to whether he will agree that it's repealed. It's, 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 uh, he can, he's the only person who can tell us. Uh, until then, uh, it will continue to be like this. Now, earlier I had stated that uh, this was the concluding part of your documentary. It turns out there's a third part. There's a final part. What's coming up in that final and that, part? That one is airing on Monday. The final part, I take you to the gallows where they used to hang them. I would, to take you, I would take you through the process, how they, they, they have to tie something to your, to your legs, how you have to be very fit before you can be executed. You have to be very fit. Why? It's, it's their practice. If you are sick, they will not execute you. You have to be very fit, and they will check, check your height, your weight, and everything to make sure you are okay before the execution takes place. Why don't they want to... So is it that they're going to feed you fat before they kill you? <laughs> no, no. It's just their practice that you, they shouldn't kill somebody who is not fit. You have to be very strong before uh, you can be killed. And you wouldn't know if they'll be coming for you today or tomorrow. So you can't feign sickness. So you'll be taking us to the gallows where the last person was executed some time in 1990. Yes, right? That's some yes. 25 years mm -hmm. ago. You must have ruffled some feathers of the prisoners in there. Yeah, they, they, it, it's not been easy for them. When I got there and they were told I will go to the gallows, they were like, what is going to happen? Has he come well, the gallows has not been opened in for a over long 10 time. years. So is he coming to remind the president that we are alive? What is he coming to do? They were so, so much afraid. But I showed them that, no, we are just doing a story. Even that, they were not really convinced. So the commander had to go to them and tell them that it's for a good cause. So you people excise patients, let him go ahead and do whatever you want to do. You, the commander had to cite them over and again before they were a little okay. They were yeah. not fully okay. So when I went in there, they were behind 
uh, they were standing close to the windows listening, listening to whatever in. I was doing over there. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, uh, Seth Kwame Wating. And that documentary, the concluding part of the documentary, will be coming up next Monday. So do make a date for that. But still ahead in the business as we take uh, still ahead in the bulletin as we take a break for business news. The Accra Metropolitan Assembly is to shut down six public toilets at Old Fodam here in Accra operating the outlawed pan latrine system. While Shuat you are in the process of shutting it down. You are also offering an alternative that this is the Gamma uh, uh, project that is coming. It says that, look, pay a little amount of money and then we'll construct this thing also for you. Stay tuned, we'll be back in a bit with business news. So again, time now for business. Good evening and welcome. Now, President Akufu Addo has reaffirmed his government's commitment towards creating many jobs through farming for the teeming unemployed youth. To this end, farmers will continue to enjoy all the necessary support and respect from government through the implementation of practical and sustainable policies. The president was launching a 10-year cashew development plan at Wenchi in the Brahafu region. The 10-year cashew development plan provides a national policy framework to revitalize the entire value chain. The development plan is unique because it is purely private-public partnership-led, which seeks to aggressively expand, modernize, and transform Ghana's cashew sector into significant foreign exchange earner, creating jobs and substantial wealth for Ghanaians. President Ekufuado stated that the introduction of the 10-year cashew development plan is in fulfillment to a promise he made during the 2016 elections. 16, some eight months to the holding of the December 2016 elections, I joined the chiefs and people of Sumahinkro in the German North constituency here in Brongaf to celebrate the Akwentukese festival. In my brief remarks, I bemoan the over-reliance of Ghanaian agriculture on the production and export of cocoa. The president further announced that cashew has been added to the list of crops to be cultivated under planting for food and jobs. I will urge the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and the Ghana Export Promotion Authority also to incorporate in this plan policies and interventions that will create additional businesses and job opportunities in the areas of storage, transport, and packaging of cashew, which will ensure that our cashew farmers earn higher income. Chief Executive of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, Gifty Kekeli Klenam, said her organization will continue to work closely with all stakeholders to enhance cashew production in Ghana. We propose for your consideration, His Excellency, the allocation of the Tuesday in the third week of every February for the opening of each cashew season. All of these initiatives are considered in line with the president beyond aid agenda to transform the Ghanaian economy, industrialize our agriculture, process of what process more of what we produce and increase our export to win ourselves from foreign aid. Executive Secretary of Cashew Industry Association of Ghana, Aaron Echian, stated that the 10-year development plan will assist all cashew value chain actors to access and expand production of cashew to a minimum of 300,000 metric tons in 10 years. Nesta Kafi Ajomas reports. Now, mining giant Anglo Ashanti says it has reached an agreement with government over the redevelopment of the Obwasi gold mine. This should see the mine, which has been operating in limited phases since 2014, resume its full functions again. Aside from the lack of new mining concessions, Anglo Gold Ashanti's operations were affected by obsolete equipment, poor security, and activities of illegal miners. The agreements signed with government include a development agreement, 
tax concession agreement, security agreement, and a reclamation security agreement. Speaking to the press on Tuesday, Managing Director of Anglo Gold Ashanti Obwasi Mine, Eric Subonteng, said a thorough feasibility study has been conducted and expressed hope it would be productive and profitable. Just like we've been doing in the past, we would be working very closely with our local stakeholders, including the local authorities, in terms of how together we can all work to ensure that the societies we are operating in uh, benefit from mining activities, and then we ensure that whatever we need to bring to the table, we bring to the table. It's always not a sustainable approach if um, you operate in isolation and thinking you can go ahead and do uh, make direct interventions. We would be working with the local communities to address, or the local authorities, I should say, to address those local developmental issues and challenges. We will be creating between 2,000 to 2,500 good quality jobs. And if you look at the life of mine, those are solid jobs, and they are skilled roles, all things being equal, because we've mentioned that into the future, we're going to run a mechanized mining operation. And we would make dedicated efforts to ensure that these employment opportunities become available to our communities. As I mentioned earlier on, we are putting in place a community or local employment procedure in a way that targets the host communities we operate within. But broadly and at a high level, our focus will be very much on trying to uh, get Ghanaians to work in the mine. Not only that, but also put in place programs that trains Ghanaians into the future. And the rollout of the tax stamp policy continues to face massive opposition as local manufacturers make a case against adequate preparation. This follows a press conference by the Food and Beverage Association of Ghana calling on government to immediately suspend the tax stamp policy. According to the association, huge infrastructural challenges, including the unbearable costs of purchasing of specialized machines, place local manufacturers in grave danger should the policy be rolled out on the 1st of March. Samuel Agri is Executive Secretary. Local manufacturers in Ghana are disturbed about the implementation of the tax stamp policy. The mother body of food and beverage manufacturers has officially expressed disappointment in the policy. At a press engagement, Executive Secretary of the Association, Samuel Agri, noted that the association wants an immediate suspension of the policy. The process that they want us to implore will be of a huge challenge and therefore we cannot do that. So the best thing we need to do is to deploy technology to achieve the same results as we all expected. In this digital age, everything is possible. We have designers in this country that can come up with all the designs and the machines that we want. Actually, a simple device that will be installed at the end of the bottling line will give you the same results that the 500,000 machine will give you as a producer. Samuel Agri fears implementation of the policy will shoot up prices of drinks, including bottled water, in the market. He is calling for broader consultation between government and industry players. If we want to be smart enough, then we'll ask the implementers to withdraw as a matter of urgency, suspend this tax stamp implementation and then get back to the table for us to discuss to get the right machines in place. The technology is there. We should be able to deploy them without asking businesses to cough up millions of cities to get the machines in place. Checks show that no beverage manufacturer has procured or installed the tax stamp affixing machine needed for the smooth enforcement of the policy. This development raises questions about the readiness of authorities to start enforcing the tax stamp policy. What we should be expected is a hike in the pricing of various locally produced you know, products here in the Ghanaian market. We are also looking, according to the executive secretary, at an increase in bottled water in terms of the pricing, as well as a collapse of various local industries here in the country. For Joy Business, Charles Aita reporting here at the industrial area in Accra. 
And that ends the business news for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Imano Abwaiti Riafi. For more business news, log on to myjohnline.com slash business. Have a good evening. Information Minister Mustafa Hamid has hinted security agencies are currently tracking down recruitment agencies and travel and tour companies recruiting young people to work in the Gulf region under the pretext of engaging them in already secured jobs. According to him, some 500 youth are currently stranded in Dubai and left to their fate by these recruitment agencies and government is working with the Consulate General in that country to bring them back home. He was speaking at a news briefing on Tuesday from where Nancy Emefajadozi reports. The government in July 2017 placed a ban on the activities of employment agencies recruiting Ghanaians for domestic work in Gulf countries. The ban follows numerous reported cases of abuse of some Ghanaians in those countries. However, the ban appears to be non-existent as government is reporting 500 Ghanaian youth are currently stranded in Dubai alone. The Consulate General in Dubai has been in regular contact with the stranded Ghanaians and is working on getting them the necessary support to return home. We wish to take the opportunity to remind Ghanaians that the ban on exportation of labor from Ghana to the Gulf is still in place. The Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations, in collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, are working to ensure that bilateral agreements are reached between Ghana and the states in the Gulf before the ban is lifted. Vice President Dr. Mamadou Baumia has expressed confidence in the economies of West African nations ahead of the fifth meeting of the Presidential Task Force on a Common Currency for the West African Monetary Zone Wednesday. The Presidential Task Force is working towards realizing a single currency for the sub-region by the year 2020. Speaking to newsmen at the Jubilee launch of the Kutuka International Airport, after receiving the presidents of Niger and Côte d'Ivoire, Dr. Baumia said the single currency would help in the creation of a vibrant economy for the sub-region. The sub-regional bodies, particularly countries involved in the creation of a single currency, are working around the clock to ensure, come 2020, the beneficiary countries will have one single currency to help transform their economies. The presidential tax force at its last meeting in October, urged member states to pursue structural reforms of their respective economies to help them deal with fluctuations in the prices of raw materials and enable their economies to be more resilient to external shocks. Tomorrow's meeting at the International Conference Centre is to reaffirm the commitment of these countries in realizing that come the end of 2020, this sub-regional body and the respective countries will have one single currency to help transform their respective economies. The issues that are going to be discussed are very, very pertinent issues for the, con con for the ECOWAS region. Uh, we want to create a very vibrant economy uh, and we want to move towards a single currency. But we cannot just get there by wishing so. Our economies have to implement sound policies so that the economies meet the convergence criteria that we have set as the primary and secondary criteria that will enable us to uh, adopt a single currency together. Um, and so we are going to see very um, fruitful discussions hopefully tomorrow by the heads of state, uh, advised by the technical people, uh, and I hope some good decisions will be taken uh, for the benefit of the whole ECOWAS sub-region. The future is very bright, and I think that what you see happening in Côte d'Ivoire, in Ghana, in other countries, uh, makes us believe that as Africans, as West Africans, we can all move beyond aid. And, and, and focus on our economies and as we try to forge ahead together. But together, we can do a lot more. From the Jubilee launch at the Kojoka International Airport, this has been Latif Idris reporting for Joy News.
Authorities of the West African Examination Council say they will step up use of the item differential profile software that they say proved very effective in curbing exam practices in the 2016 basic education certificate examination and the West African senior secondary certificate examination. The IDP analyzes the responses of candidates and is able to detect a more practice if 80% of candidates choose the same wrong response in multiple choice tests. YX decision follows public concerns in recent past about the exam of practices that have led to several cancellations. The council has been interacting with journalists in Accra. Here is Jacqueline Johnson Quay's report. In the 2016 Basic Education Certificate Examination, more than 20,000 candidates were involved in exam malpractices, with schools in the Western region recording the highest number of malpractices. Officials of YX say Tuesday's media interaction was to seek the assistance of the media to sensitize the public on measures they are taking to curb the exam malpractices in 2018. Head of National Exams Administration at WAEG, Wendy Adilamti, says the software helps examiners to check collusion in the written paper, which was not possible prior to the introduction of the software. I bring to you, or I present to you, the item differential profile software. And this is one of the international accepted procedures used to curb examination practice. On his part, head of WAEG National Office in Ghana, Reverend Samuel Olenu, revealed that the upcoming WASI had been shifted from February to April following talks with government. One of the important, um, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, item that we have put on the program and before us is also to sensitize you about the forthcoming examinations that is was for school candidates which this time round is not starting in February, but on April 3. The, you know, formally we were starting in February, and the government appealed to us. Reverend Samuel Lenu also appealed to the media to help WAEC in its fight against examination malpractices at a basic and secondary level. The Volta Region Police Command and the command of the 66th Artillery Regiment have launched Operation Calm Life in the Volta Region. The operation aims to combat and reduce crime as well as flash out criminal elements from communities in the region. Fred Kwame Asari's report. The Operation Calm Life Task Force is a joint military police contingent. Five hard body vehicles have been allocated for the operation to enhance mobility of the contingent and ensure swift response to crime alerts across the region. As part of the operation, a joint operation center connected with a video surveillance system has been set up at the Volta Regional Police Headquarters. The unit picks feed from a networked CCTV camera system situated at vantage points in major cities in the region to help monitor human activities and easily identify miscreants and wrongdoers in the society. The Volta Police Command has also purchased a drone to help in tracing and trailing criminals who would bolt after committing their crimes. Speaking at the launch, the Volta Regional Police Commander, ACP Nana Asimahine, noted the operation would focus on areas identified to have high incidence of crime. As part of elaborate plans to ensure the total success of this exercise, a joint operation center, we call it JOC, under the command of a senior police officer has been established at the regional police headquarters who, where all activities of the operational teams will be coordinated. By this address, I urge all in Sandri to lend your support to this worthy cause so that the people of the Volta region will go about their various socio-economic activities without fear. I must tell you that I have personally acquired a drone which we showcased here to support the Christian Khan life. The Commander Rear of the 66th Artillery Regiment, Major Edward Apia, lauded government for the initiative and called on the public to support the security services with information to ensure success of the operation. Warming that we have met here this afternoon to perform a simple but important task. You will all agree with me that Operation Come Life which we are relaunching today 
has, no, has not been so active due to some challenges. Let me, on behalf of the seven garrison of the Ghana Armed Forces and the 66th Artillery Regiment, thank the government for the support we have received so far, so far as the, this operation is concerned. With this support, we stand ready to support our police counterparts in ensuring that crime is not given any space in the region. Let me use this opportunity to assure the local population of the region the commitment of the military to ensuring that crime in whatever form is brought to its barest minimum so that you'll be able to move about with your daily activities in peace. As a military, we can play our part, but without the support and cooperation of the local population, this operation cannot succeed. I therefore call on the people of the Volta region to grant the tax force all the support we need in order to keep you safe in the region and the country as a whole. I once again wish to thank the government for the providing us the needed vehicles to carry this operation, to carry out this operation, and wish to assure you, Deputy Regional Minister, who is standing in for the Regional Minister, of our judicious use of these vehicles and also to ensure that they are all well maintained at all times. Thank you all and may God bless us all. Thank you very much. There was a joint police and military route march through the principal streets of Ho to exhibit the readiness of the security services in combating crime. Fred Kwame Asaris report for Joy News. A chips compound constructed for the Kong electoral area by the Saola District Assembly four years ago is still under lock and key, forcing the people in the area to travel about 26 kilometers to Tuna, or in some cases about 57 kilometers to Saola to seek medical care. Many pregnant women have had to give birth halfway through the journey because of the distance. Even though the chief and people of the area have volunteered to furnish the facility, it is yet to be opened. Martina Bugri reports. Assemblyman for the Co Electoral Area, Hamid Mutalim, said the community has recorded several deaths due to lack of a health facility in the area. We have uh, recorded a lot of deaths just because of uh, this, uh, I'm talking of this uh, health facility not being in use. Whenever a woman is in labor, anytime or most of the times, the woman or the women that we do transport to Tuna. Some of them, on our way to that particular facility, they, 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 they give birth on the way. And sometimes, they, they, unfortunate things happen. Sometimes we lost the, the, the baby, and even the women, some of them bleed to death. So it's, 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 it's a very worrying situation that uh, we are facing in uh, Kong here. Mr. Mutalim said snake bites are common in the area and when it happens, they suffer the same fate. In other cases too, or instances where we do have snake bites, it's also another challenge in this community, Kong. Anytime somebody had a snake bite, we have to carry that person to Tuna, as I mentioned earlier on. And when we get to Tuna too, they will refer that person. They will tell us that uh, they have no medicine to cure that particular uh, snake bite or that particular uh, this, uh, disease. So they would either refer us to Bole or even Wa sometimes. So we are calling on government uh, to come to our aid and other philanthropists. We are suffering, people of Kong are suffering. A nursing mother, Amina Amidu, said she gave birth halfway through the journey to the health center when she was in labor. She called for support for the opening of the clinic to reduce the problems they encounter. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll help her at the So, say, I'm going to call her and cry. She said, I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry. Say, 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 I'm going to cry. And also, quite what? Oh, be seen, ma. So, about who I just said the motor fan. And they be how could drug and so I know I woo or honum. Say, what in your cry, crown, own fan. Missy, I cry, wait, time I had me call Doctor Sam and call me call woo, quiet so. 
ewo me ne be ma ba kokura oba anim ente ya brapa ya hospital ya si ye hunu omu ntimi mbie ya ya se wo ba ya le a ji se wo a wo de ne she wachi no wa kotu na e bia wo be kwa kwa do na wi abo sa wo be wo be kwa kwa do kura no na wo kura na wo ya le ya ka kura no ho so amu wo bo bia mo me bo aye na I how on so enjoy so. Now, lack of water at the Ghana Water Company Reservoir and hydrants in the Wa municipality has been blamed for the inability of the Ghana National Fire Service to put out a fire that gutted three buildings, including a local commercial radio station WFM in Wam. Fire ravaged the radio station and completely burned the equipment worth thousands of Ghana cities. Join us this Apple West correspondent Rafiq Salam reports the personnel of the Ghana National Fire Service who were fighting the inferno were forced to move to the Wadia Dam, which is 10 kilometers away from the fire scene, due to lack of water at the YGWCL reservoir and hydrants in the Wa municipality. According to the program manager of the first commercial radio station in the Upper West region, WFM Rasbo Pelipu. He was informed by the station security man who was on duty last night that the fire started at the main studio of the radio station at dawn. Personnel of the Ghana National Fire Service were called and they responded quickly. They were unable to completely douse the fire before they ran out of water. Um, the fire service came around but unfortunately uh, they ran short of water and according to them it was very difficult assessing water. So it took the second uh, vehicle about 30 minutes to come and uh, within some five minutes they also ran out of water. Even if, uh, as you can see right now, we still have fire on parts of the building but they told us uh, there is no water in any of the two hydrants within the one municipality. So it's very difficult getting water. Ras Bob noted that even though it is too early to conclude that the fire may be as a result of power fluctuation from the VRA Nerco, he however has a firm belief that it could be the cause. I think it might come from the power fluctuations. You know, last night we had power fluctuations. And according to my technician, as at uh, 4 o'clock a.m., he was here to start transmission. But uh, the whole of this area, they had light out. So, and uh, we also had battery, solar. But uh, the power was not enough to start the transmitter. So he waited for a while, and uh, later he saw sparks from the meter went into the studio and uh, also saw sparks from the meter. And I'm thinking that around that time, uh, probably it was the power fluctuations, because around that time, even my own house, the power was on and off, on and off. Several equipment, where thousands of Ghana cities, was completely bent into ashes. There were no casualties. The only thing that they were able to rescue from the blazing fire is a transmitter. Everything is gone. Um, the entire building, our equipment, including some personal belongings, you know, our computers, printers, flash screen televisions, some personal belongings, and even including some monies, all gone. But uh, as of now, I am unable to quantify uh, those ones because we are yet to uh, bring those things together because other persons are complaining of some personal belongings and monies that they've also lost. Personnel of the Ghana National Fire Service have already started investigation on the issue. Before the investigation comes to an end, Upper West Public Relations Officer of the Ghana National Fire Service, ADO Boko B. Martin, is already proffering that the whole structure be pulled down because its integrity is being compromised. Yes, you know, water is a key component in any uh, uh, concrete mix. And looking at the intensity of the heat that these walls have been exposed to, you will see, you look around, if you enter the structure, you will see that the walls are cracked, the beams are cracked. So when it is exposed to so much heat like that, the moisture component in the cement, in the, in the concrete, is compromised. So our advice would be that the structure must uh, be pulled down. The Ghana Water Company Limited is required to at least keep a certain minimum percentage of water at their reservoir for emergency cases. However, it was not the case when the firefighters ran out of water and had to depend on the Wadia Dam, which is located 10 kilometers away from the scene of the fire. 
acting upper west regional chief engineer martin kofi and sa asante blamed the lack of water at the reservoir and hydrants due to a fault on the energy meter who took close to a week to correct it was because of the shortfall we had in the system to record the shortfall we had in the, in the system that is the, the reason it was not any deliberate attempts yes we understand that should, we should have minimum minimum levels for emergency issues like this but we were also challenged by the incidents that i've spoken about earlier we had a challenge with uh, our energy meter the intake when i say energy meter i mean the vre energy meter it got bent the report was that it got bent so in changing over we had to take it took, took some time to stabilize the system it's unfortunate but that, that, that is how uh, i can explain it supporting for the news rafik salam wow. this is joy news prime and in the headlines, Parliament approves nomination of former Attorney General Martin Yamidu as Ghana's first special prosecutor, despite a minority member's attempt to scuttle it. Accra Metropolitan Assembly to shut down six public toilets at Old Fodama here in Accra, operating the outlawed pan latrine system. In business, President Kufuado reaffirms government's commitment to generate massive employment opportunities for the youth through agriculture as he launches new 10-year cash development plan at Winchi in the Brown Harpo region. General Agricultural Workers Union also demands from the Agric Ministry details on the over 700,000 employed and the government's flagship planting for food and jobs programme. 